Good morning, this is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from Miami. Uh, we have another episode. Oh, actually, we have the inaugural episode of the uh, Residence Corner of the IgniteTheJournal.net. And today we have the pleasure of having Manuel Encarnacion, a gentleman I've known for a couple of years. He's from the Dominican Republic. Uh, he's now a second year resident in, in Russia. And he's going to present on hemispherectomy. Uh, welcome, Emmanuel. It's all yours. Hello, John. Thank you so much. Uh, well, thanks everybody for being here. So today we're going to talk about hemispherectomy. It's a very advanced surgery, very complicated surgery. Uh, so uh, as my level of second year resident, I don't going to talk too much about the surgical technique. I don't going to talk about surgical technique because the master around here, Neurosurgical TV, is and they can talk about that and their cases. So what I'm gonna talk is um, just the, the basic steps, the, the useful stuff residents should know about this technique. Because like uh, René Descartes say, from the simple to the complex. So first we need to know indication, complication, and when we're gonna use this kind of technique, and then, we go to the uh, complicate um, the technical part. So, John, uh, I can start now. Yes, for sure. Okay. Okay. Okay, so you make it bigger, right? Okay. Okay, but mm, not yet, not yet. Oh, good. Do you see me? Not yet. I. Uh, you don't see the whole screen. You got to make it bigger. Yeah. There, there you go. Perfect. Perfect. Right there. Perfect. Ah, good. Good. I learned a lot at last. Okay, we're learning. We're both learning. So. About the hemispherectomy, like the, the principal topic, or the, a simple way we can say is when the half is better than the whole, because we're gonna use, uh, the patient gonna use only one part of the brain, but why, how it's possible? So uh, the definition of, of hemispherectomy, we can say is the, um, we, we remove, a, a part of the telencephalo. It's like the basic, uh, the, the first definition. But we're gonna see it's, it's not like that. If we don't, we don't remove the whole hemisphere you know, anymore. First, we need to know about the history. The first uh, hemispherectomy was performed by Dandy in 1928. He made this, uh, this surgery from glioma. He operated five glioma. But what happened? He removed, he removed the hemisphere, but the problem was the glioma, it made metastasis, made metastasis to the other side. So for this tumor, for tumors, definitely is no good surgery. So later, uh, later in the 1938, Kenneth McKenzie uh, from Canada made the first, uh, the, first, the, the first report for this kind of surgery in epilepsy. Crenau in 1950, uh, he's from, um, from South Africa, they made, performed the first resection for drug resist, uh, resistant epilepsy. So after a, a big period of time, the, this kind of surgery was the anatomic hemispherectomy. So in the 60 and 17, uh, uh, um, we, we see the complication uh, because they make a, a core a study about this patient. They, they follow this, this patient and see a lot of complication. For example, the superficial cerebral hemosiderosis was the very common. Hydrocephalus also. 
and this complication three or five pa of this patient was fatal outcome. Later in the 1983, Theodor Brandt Rasmussen performs um, a new technique. A new technique it's called functional he uh, hemispherectomy. But uh, this technique started to, to be used in the 1992 after a brief description of his thin approach. La, for example, like Delande and Ramusen. We're going to talk a little more about that later. So, when we consider hemispherectomy, we consider hemispherectomy in the medical intractable hemisphere epilepsy. But by definition, a severe uh, um, medical intractable em uh, epilepsy is a severe and life threatening seizures arising from a significant damage several hemisphere. The etiology of this intractable uh, epilepsy, we consider the hemispherectomy here. We can, this is the five more common examples. We have from mucin encephalitis, a stroke, hemispheric cortical dysplasia, Stuckweber syndrome, a, and the hemimegaloencephaly. The Ramusen encephaly, encephalitis, the pathophysiology of this disease is not well understood. But the clinical syndrome is, uh, we're gonna see always epilepsy, a progressive hemiparesis, and later, this is the, in the first stage, and later we're gonna see the, um, the resulting in hemiplegia, mental decline, and hemispheric atrophy. Usually this patient, the year of, we can see this disease is the fourth year, normally, fourth year. It's important, uh, later we're gonna see the Stuckel Weber syndrome. It's a, another congenital disorder, uh, have a different um, natural history, very variable. Characteristic we're gonna have the lectomenia and hematosis. In the big proportion of cases, we're gonna have a facial nebus here, facial nebus you can see here in the picture, a wine porto a sting, it's also called it. You can see here. Uh, we can find cortical calcification, cerebral atrophy, uh, and mental retardation. It's normally we can see this. The seizures uh, usually develop at the end of the first year. The hemimegaloencephaly. Uh, this patient usually they have a big, like the name say, like they, they have a big hemisphere, um, a big and also big ventricles. Um, the brain itself is going to have a normal architecture. They also can have uh, pachyhyria, polymicrogyria, uh, grossly engorged, uh, enlarged gyrus, and, and normally they have around the, uh, around the white matter in the ventricles, they're going to have ectopic gray matter. Now, um, the, the reason of the, the etiology is, um, it's a problem in the migration, uh, in, in the develop of the neuro, in the neurosurgical and the brain, in the brain development. The perinatal stroke, as his name say, uh, we're gonna have uh, this stroke. The stroke is uh, for the occlusion. Of the of the vessels in the develop, it can be in neonatal, neonatal or perinatal stage. You see me, John? Hello. Yeah, yes, we can see very well. No, it's because the 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 PowerPoint. Yes, yes. Okay. Are you frozen? Yes, yes. Okay. I, I, 
Okay. Uh, do we, okay. Do we, okay. I'm moving. Okay. So, okay. we've seen the, because the, the, the other PowerPoint was, uh, this is the hemimegaloencephaly, well, as you can see here. You can see, you can see here the enlarged Yeah, we can see, we can see your drawing. Yeah, we can see your okay. drawing. Okay, you can see the enlarged hemisphere, you can see here. Something important, uh, we, um, we can see the big ventricles, enlarged ventricles, and around the ventricles, we can see a dy dystopic area of the gray matter around the white matter. Okay. Okay, you changed. Yes, yes. So the hemispheric cortical dysplasia. I, I had the wrong the wrong PowerPoint. It's a it's a problem of the migration. It's a problem of the migration of the develop of the of the develop of the cortical area in the brain. We can have a very thin uh, cortex. So about the contraindication. Uh, of the hemispherectomy. Uh, well, after the presurgical evaluation, if the presurgical evaluation cannot demonstrate that all typical ictal activity came from the affected hemisphere, definitely we don't perform, we not perform the surgery. Definitely not. Another relative uh, contraindication may be seen in the patient arising seizures from the healthy, healthy hemisphere. And also, the incomplete immunopia may be considered a contraindication. About the timing, something we need to, do, to always understand is Small the, the, the kit in the kids uh, this kind of surgery is, is very problematic. It's, it's a big surgery. We're gonna have a child of four kilograms, two kilograms, and the blood loss in them is have very catastrophic results. But something good about that, about the, the operation in, in in child is the neuroplasticity. It's something is we're gonna have a balance. So, for example, the the children with the hemispheric malformation, uh, they can be the the surgeries need to be made in the first four months, for example. The surgical evaluation, the always first is the clinical is serve the patient. Then we're gonna have the very, very high quality MRI. Also, we're gonna use the video recording of the seizure, uh, video, video recording of the electroencephalogram of the seizures. He, and something important here, we're gonna use the WADA test. The WADA test we're gonna use to see in which area or in which hemisphere we're gonna find the dominant area of the language motor. Also, the water test is called intracarotid amoarbital amo test. The surgical goals. The first is cessation of the seizures. That's the first one. That's the first one. The first stop, the first uh, goal is that. Second, is a minimize the risk. The risk we're gonna find is the hydrocephalus. Usually in the anatomy hemispherectomy, we're gonna have an obstruction of the of the Monroe foramen. It's, it's, it can happen. Also the blood loss, because as I say in the beginning, the kids the kids can cannot support the big blood loss. But this kind of surgery, the uh, the blood loss is 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 huge. The coagulopathy, because the the brain the, the brain tissue it have uh, anticoagulant substance. All these anticoagulant substance go into the to the blood system, and we can have the coagulopathy then. 
the acetic meningitis, also it can happen. The hypothermia. About the hypothermia, an open question for everybody. Do you know if this can be brain protecting? So what do you think? Because if we take the, the patient temperature in 34 grades, it can be a brain protector. And maybe, I didn't read if in this kind of surgery, they, um, they use the hypothermia, like a brain protection. But in a lot of uh, surgeries, uh, in, in have, have a poor outcome, poor, uh, poor results, because you need to make a, a big studies about that. So an open question, what do you think about the hypothermia in this kind of surgeries? You think it can help, like a brain protection? It's an open question. Okay. Okay, we passed. So the position, in this case, John, I have the, the position is from anatomic hemispherectomy because the, um, the approach from the functional hemispherectomy, it's, it's small, it's more, more small. This is the position as we can see, look the position of the bed. We already know for what reason it's going to decrease the, the blood loss. So here we are seeing the two principal kinds of hemispherectomy. We have here, the classic anatomic hemispherectomy. This uh, is, is the definition of hemispherectomy. And here we can see the functional hemispherectomy. Because what they do in the functional hemispherectomy is disconnect areas, disconnect areas. They, they don't remove the whole, the whole brain. So, it doesn't matter which one we perform. If we perform the anatomic hemispherectomy um, or the functional hemispherectomy, the main point is in all the surgeries, first, remove here, you see, the internal capsule and corona radiata, resection of the medial temporal lobe, transventricular corpus callosotomy, and frontal tractomy. That's the four principal basic of hemispherectomy. It doesn't matter, it's the functional, or, and of course the anatomy hemispherectomy, we perform all of them. So, as we say here, the anatomy hemispherectomy, you see, we remove all the hemisphere, but we respect the ganglions, we respect the ganglions also. That's the, 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 the only we respect of the of this whole hemisphere, the part of the encephalon. But problem, uh, in this case, you see this picture, is the hydrocephalo, hydrocephalia caused by an hemispherectomy. It's very common and have a very poor outcome. So, which one of the benefit of removing less brain? We have smaller craniotomy. Smaller craniotomy is small time. Uh, the patient is going to recover more fast. We have the reduced operative time, reduce blood loss. That's very, very important. They will decrease the time of infection, decrease the risk of hydrocephalus. Here we have the functional hemispherectomy. You can see we respect the, tempo, the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, but we remove the temporal lobe here. But we disconnect all the structures, connect all the, all the lobes. That's important. This is the scan. The, the, the sketch of the functional hemispherectomy 
you can see here. This is the, the way we're gonna approach. Also, we can make the periinsular hemispherectomy. It's a part of the functional hemispherectomy, okay? We respect the, the insula, the lobe, insula lobe here. We remove all around, all around. But again, you can see, you, you, we respect the frontal, the, the occipital lobe also. So here you can see the plane of the frontal differentiation here and the plane of the occipital one. We remove all this here, all the temporal lobe here. And um, temporal, parietal, we remove. So another variation of the functional hemispherectomy is the vertical and lateral is is the way of our approach. The way of our approach is going to be we can use these two different kinds. But as we say, always need to respect the frontal, occipital, and the structure of the, the encephalo. This is the vertical one. He's from um, performs in France from the La Land. So something important, less resection, more disconnection. That's the way uh, of the perform the uh, hemispherectomy right now. You can see here about the Rasmussen hemispherectomy. It's change um, the anatomy hemispherectomy. The complication because every surgery has complication and this is a big surgery and gonna have a big complication. We can have the interoperative complication, early postoperative complication, late postoperative complication. One of the the most uh, we, we need to be afraid is the incomplete disconnection. The incomplete disconnection can be um, unintentional. And, and also recognized in the operation room. The complete disconnection not only occur, not only happens in the disconnection technique, in the functional one. So the interpretive complication, of course, that's one of the most the, the most uh, we need to afraid more, the blood loss, electrolyte uh, loss or disturbance, coagulation disorders, hypovolemia, also bradycardia, hypothermia. This is the, the like the the, um, the normal complication we can have interoperative. The uh, the early postoperative complication include the again the electrolyte disturbance. Diabetes insipidus or syndrome of intra, uh, inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion, swelling, uh, swelling of the contralateral uh, hemisphere. That's important. We can find also uh, sudural hygroma. And the late postoperative complication hydrocephalus uh, infection. This is the, 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 the late postoperative complication we can find. So we can Are you okay, Manuel? Yes, yes. I just was marking like uh, an easy way to remember, an easy way to remember here. Okay. So, the comparison in outcome, as you can see, there is no prospective randomized comparison. We need to be uh, to think very well in which case we can use each one of them, because uh, the seizures they they disappear in 85, 90 percent of the patients usually in in both of cases. 
no one of them, not the functional hemispherectomy or the anatomic hemispherectomy have a better outcome in relation of the scissors. But, of course, if you have a functional one, the blood loss is gonna be less. The time, the time of operation gonna be less. So, but there is a lot of stuff to think about it. Usually, normally, uh, all the centers use the functional hemispherectomy. Is like is the is the choice right now. The bibliography I put in the in the bottom of the all the all the page of the all the slides. You can see all the um, bibliography here. Questions. Okay, very good. Very good. Uh, uh, okay, Manuel. Muy bueno. Uh, I'd like to see if there have any people that have any questions or or comments for man for Manuel. Does anybody in the panel have anything they want to bring up? Well, I can see here there is a resident here. Oh, oh good. You know, good. Musa. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, great. That's that's great. He's one of the residents here. He's first year resident. Maybe he can have uh, some comments, some questions. Okay. Would you, would you like to volunteer a third year resident, please? Is he from your school, uh, your your hospital, Emmanuel? Yes, 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 yes. He is. Uh, we are rotation. We're making rotation right now in the pediatric hospital. Oh, what's the name? Our, our Rava. Uh, what? What's his name? Is he there now? Yes, General Musa. He's from Zambia. Okay. Hi, hi, Doctor Musa. Hello. Hi, Doctor Bennett. How are you? Good. No, welcome. Oh, thank you. That was a very good presentation, Manuel. That's uh, very, very clear. Uh, so, General, what do you think about, because I was talking about the hypothermia, because I was reading if we can use hypothermia, hypothermia like uh, brain protection. Mm -hmm. We can use it maybe in this kind of surgery, but in, the, in a lot of surgeries. Have any, any opinion about that or about the hemispherectomy? Both, both. Both. <laughs> we got you. We got you. <laughs> we well, got you. You can't get out. You can't get out of this. I can't get out. It's like no. <laughs> no, he's very good, John. He's very good. He's very good student. Very good. Okay, you're in Zambia. Could you introduce yourself, to Gerald? Uh, Okay, no, I'm uh, Jared Musa. I'm um, uh, a resident at uh, People's Friendship University in Russia, Moscow. Oh, okay. And uh, originally from Zambia. Okay, welcome. You're, you're there now. You're there in Russia now, right? Yes, I'm in, in Russia now, yes. Okay, yeah, we've had webcasts with Zambia. Uh, a good mom from Livingston. Oh, really? Uh, are you from Livingston? Oh, yes, yes. I'm from Livingston, yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, well, we've talked with people there a while back. Oh, okay, but, great. But anyways, could you, you, you we're not going to forget the hemispherectomy question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't want to put him in that situation, never. No, of course not. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I mean, my, my comment on uh, hypothermia, uh, well, with hemispherectomy, I haven't found a lot of literature uh, with regards to um, hypothermia and hemispherectomy. I've seen it more uh, in literature concerning trauma with uh, brain protection and, re and reducing the metabolic rate and the, um, the oxygen um, requirements of the, of the brain when you use hypothermia to a certain degree. But with uh, hemispherectomy, I haven't really come across that information. New to me in this case. Yeah. So. 
That's my comment on the, on on hypothermia with the hysterectomy. No, no, no. It, no, it's an it's an open it's an open table it's an open table because for example I I didn't find any information about that because all the information just say we need to to be careful uh, about the hypothermia but it, it's like a it's like a very delicate balance before between be careful of hypothermia but also the hypothermia can help us. Mm. There's something we can we can we need to see in the future. Interesting. Uh, have you had uh, man, Manuel? I have a question. Are you have you assisted on many hemispherectomies? No, 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 no. Because this is like, relatively like, rare. I, I, relatively rare. I, I, huh? No, uh, they perform in in my hospital. They, I'm I'm making rotation now in the pediatric. Last last week they perform one hemispherectomy, but. As a second year resident, I feel very interesting about this surgery because it's, um, of course, all in neurosurgery is, is very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, come, take my attention because it's, uh, it's a huge surgery. It's a huge surgery. And my question was, wow, how after this kind of surgery, um, the patient can have like um, a normal develop, normal life. But the point is, the, as I say, the cerebral uh, neuroplasticity works so very good. Like this hemisphere have the, uh, the disease, for example, uh, Ramusen encephalitis, but to, to say something, the other hemisphere take the control, take the control of the language of the mother area. Of course, the patient gonna have some some problem in future, for example, mental uh, retardation, gonna have some problem of motor problem. But uh, it's interesting because thanks to the neuroplasticity, the patients can go with a good outcome. No 100%, but something like 90%. And this kind of surgery, of course, is it, uh, not all the centers make this kind of surgery. Um, you need to be, you need to make a very, very, con very precise uh, pre-surgical evaluation to see, to, to say this patient needs a full uh, hemispherectomy because remove, remove one hemisphere is, it's, it's nothing, it's something you cannot take so, so easily. So right. that is take my attention. It's a huge procedure, right? You, you must have. Yes, 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 it is. It is. Four it or five is. hours very, very at least. How long would it, does it take typically? About four or five hours? Five, six hours. Okay. So it's five, considered, six hours. considered example, a long case. For example, I have the, the, the pictures of the, um, and some video of the surgery they perform in the, in the center in rotation now in Marosovskaya. Uh, but I don't put it because, as I say, if I'm not in the, um, it's not the kind of surgery of second year residents can perform and can talk about technique. So I, what I think, first, I talk about the basic, about when we're going to do the surgery, how, contraindication, complication, and then we can go for, for the surgical technique. Okay. Uh, well, uh, just a question, maybe to Manuel. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, um, what, what is the pathophysiology of uh, the hydrocephalus? Because once you remove, uh, no, once... it's because hmm? yep. it's because when you remove when you remove the full the the hemisphere, hmm. um, you make obstruction. You you make the obstruction of the of the Monroe foramen from different causes, for blood, or from the same tissues, uh, obst make obstruction here. And that, that can create the uh, hydrocephalus. Mm, I see. But uh, with, uh, because once you, you do, for example, a um, hemispherectomy, you've, you've basically removed one half of the brain. So I'm yes. expecting that this hydrocephalus should be an asymptomatic hydrocephalus because then there'll be no uh, increase in intracranial pressure, or does it still occur in this in this patients? Yes, increase, it increase. For example, you see the the uh, the slides I put. Uh, you can see the full the full ventricle. Mm, wait.
Wait, I'm gonna show you now. Right. Here, for example. You can see here. The problem is that all the material can make the obstruction of the ceiling, oh, sorry, of the monroe for ramming. That can be, that's one of the reasons of the hydrocephalus. Mm. The same brain tissues, the hemosiderosis, the, the blood material itself. Oh, I see. Yeah. I see. So, any questions? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Any uh, yeah. any more questions or comments? Uh, uh, this this platform is new. Uh, we encourage interactivity. It's a little tough. Uh, most people are pretty shy uh, at first, but uh, and, and certainly you're welcome. We found sometimes when we ask people to post questions uh, in the chat. Yes, of course. In, of in course. the chat. Uh, you, you can ask any questions or comments, uh, but I certainly don't d discourage people from just coming and watching. That's fine. So, okay, Manuel, I guess uh, unless we have more f further comments or questions, we'll wrap it up. I'd like to thank well, you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, John. Thank you for the time. And uh, I, Gerald Musa, I think uh, we should ask him to speak on hypothermia for a couple hours next, <laughs> a couple hours next week. <laughs> well, but now I think Gerald can give a lecture about hypothermia in brain surgery. What do you think, Gerald? No, I mean, everything is possible. We can, we can always yeah. make that. No, we won't put you on the spot. We won't. We 